Hello, and welcome to Connected with Latham, where we discuss ideas, legal developments, and business trends shaping the global economy. I'm Ben Potter, a corporate partner in our Bay Area office. In this episode, we're talking about mergers and acquisitions in the technology industry and beyond. And with me here is Luke Bergstrom, a corporate partner in our Bay Area office as well. So 2020 has been an interesting year, starting with COVID-19 and its impact on your practice. Could you share some comments on how it's impacted M&A activity globally and specifically any trends you've seen in tech M&A? Sure, uh, Ben, I'd be happy to do so. I mean, obviously the uh, global deal-making environment has been substantially impacted by COVID and its effects on the economy, not just here in the U.S., but what we're seeing, quite frankly, in any any market anywhere around the globe. In terms of overall trends, and I, I'm not going to sit here with a bunch of stats, but uh, just more what we have seen and experienced at Latham, which I think is consistent with what you know people are seeing globally. Definitely fewer mega deals uh, this year. We've certainly had our fair share of them, uh, and uh, you know have led the league tables in overall value for deals globally this year. But with that, there there have been fewer large deals. Valuations, I think, have taken a bit of a hit over the year. But but we'll talk about some pockets where that's not necessarily the case that I think will be of interest to folks. But overall, what we what we've really experienced is less deal volume. And again, you know, you've got to parse through that a bit um, because there are some areas, uh, certainly some that are uh, uh, our focus, where uh, we've seen tremendous activity this year, notwithstanding the overall slowdown in M and A deal activity. And then finally, for you know, a, a good chunk of the year, we saw a, a significant decrease overall in uh, activity amongst private equity funds, either in in uh, purchases or exits, uh, that, that market certainly seems to be heating up more. Um, that's been the trend over the last two months, but certainly uh, when, when COVID did initially hit uh, and as it, it made its way across the globe, you know, activity seemed to uh, slow substantially in the PE uh, space, um, you know, concurrent with that. Luke, thanks for that overview. Super helpful. So, so are there any, um, building on what you said around tech in your prior remarks, are, are there any um, specific industries where you can comment or there have been specific impacts this year um, that have been specific to COVID-19 or other changes in the worldwide economy? Yeah, Ben, I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I think it's important to note that, you know, even with an overall slowdown in deal activity, there are sectors where we're still seeing significant activity and people have been extraordinarily busy and in two areas in particular. And I don't think this should be a surprise given what we're seeing with the pandemic. We're seeing uh, significant activity in the life uh, sciences space as well as in technology. And within that, it's not everywhere. It's not every you know, subsector within those industries. Um, but just taking tech as an example, the way that we shop, the way that we communicate, the way that we go to school, all of these are being you know, changed completely around as a result of the pandemic. Are these changes gonna last forever? Are they accelerating trends that we're already seeing in the marketplace? Most likely, but they have resulted in you know, some clear winners and losers in terms of what we're seeing in, in, uh, as to where people are putting their money and where there's been a lot of activity. So, you know, just to give you an example, we're all communicating uh, today remotely. So one area that's been hot is definitely um, uh, remote communications. Uh, you're seeing this in terms of conferencing capabilities um, for uh, any business, any enterprise out there nowadays. We're also seeing this um, in the payment space and businesses that are focused on e-commerce, um, there's been a tremendous uptick in activity there. What's interesting, Ben, and what sets this apart from, for instance, what we saw back in 2008 is despite unprecedented levels of unemployment, for instance, in the United States, we're still seeing substantial activity in capital markets and in M&A. This is completely different than what we saw in 2008, for example. And so, um, you know, a lot of this, this business activity that we're seeing now 
is very strategic in nature and we think it will have long-term impacts. And in fact, businesses that have strong balance sheets or that have the ability to borrow now are looking at, at this as an opportunity, not just to do deals in the same verticals they've always done deals in, but to some degree, they're looking beyond uh, just their core competencies to see that there is a, a change in the markets that's coming. They need to be able to adapt to that uh, in, a, in a very broad strategic sense. And that's driving a lot of the activity that we are seeing. You mentioned um, that the capital markets are um, incredibly busy. How is that um, playing and, and where are you seeing that uh, be relevant in the M&A markets as you just described earlier? It's a great question. Um, you know, what we, what we are seeing this year, uh, you know, continuation of last year uh, is a rise in dual track and even tri track processes where, um, you know, it's, it's definitely been a seller's market in the last few years. I mean, we've all experienced this in, in uh, you know, in the M&A ranks. So Ben, you've probably seen this yourself in terms of the substantial activity in the capital market space, you know, in and of itself, it's robust and noteworthy, but that also has an impact on what we see in the M&A process, because as long as companies have, you know, the IPO route as a credible alternative to a sell side liquidity event, they can use that leverage um, to drive better terms, both in terms of price, as well as just deal terms generally on an M&A event as well. But what's interesting also is we've really seen a rise um, in the number of SPAC transactions, which are um, special purpose acquisition companies. So these are companies that go public uh, for the express purpose of finding a hot private company to merge with uh, and thereby take that private company public. Um, and you know the, the, the SPAC structure has been around for quite some time. What has changed in just the last few years and has really arisen in the last two years is a growth in SPACs um, uh, driven by um, some pretty well-heeled um, uh, investors. So it's, it's a different um, mix of capital than it used to be, uh, where it wasn't as attractive for a real hot company to go public this route. Um, but now you actually are seeing processes that are tri-track in the sense of it could, a uh, company could go IPO, uh, it could sell itself to a strategic, um, uh, or it could look for a DSPAC transaction, which is you know where, where you merge uh, with one of the SPACs that's out there looking for a merger partner. Um, and so uh, you know we're, we're, we're seeing all sorts of flavors of deals um, getting done at this point. Um, but that's also keeping uh, this from folding into a, a buyer's market, right? Or collapsing into a buyer's market is that in certain industries, um, you know, as I mentioned, things remain very hot uh, and, um, uh, and, these, and the high flying companies really have a lot of alternatives available to them uh, for a liquidity event. That's all very interesting to hear, um, especially, um, how, how the SPAC market has evolved. And certainly a lot of us have seen that um, in, in a visceral sort of way the past few months. Uh, switching gears um, a, a bit, um, and you touched on it in those remarks, but are, are there any other specific M&A deal terms that um, ha have seen an evolution during this period over the last few months during 2020? And if so, what are those? A couple of things worth pointing to there, Ben. I mean, first off, um, you know, the you, you first really started seeing um, a change in deal terms in the spring. So just, just say March, April, it, you know, right after um, uh, the pandemic really started hitting in the United States. And then at that point, the first thing people focused on was trying to carve out from the definition of a material adverse effect um, anything related to the pandemic. So the idea was, hey, if you're looking to acquire me, um, you know that there's a pandemic raging and nobody knows how this is going to play out. Um, so it's buyer beware. Over time, you've seen a bit of a shift there. Uh, and um, you've seen negotiations from buyers where they say, okay, I get that. 
But if there's been a disproportionate impact on your business um, uh, as a result of this uh, pandemic, then we should have the ability as, as the buyer to walk away from that. Um, and and so uh, and that's that's not uh, that, that's not surprising in, in in any way that that it would start to move in that direction. Um, we've seen sellers try and carve out um, from things like their interim operating covenants, uh, which are typical uh, restrictions or limitations on what a seller can do with the business between sign and close. W what we've seen is a growth in. Um, uh, you know, carve outs where the, um, the seller says, I, I should be able to take measures um, to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on my business, even if it's not one of these enumerated uh, items that I've asked for an exception from the interim operating covenant. So, uh, you know, you see things like that creeping into deal making now. Um, you know, after the stimulus package was passed and, and uh, you know, numerous businesses went out to get the PPP loans, uh, even though there was, uh, uh, you know, great concern over, um, you know, the applicability of that program uh, to certain buyers or, or certain borrowers, um, you know, you've seen reps and warranties uh, grow around whether or not someone's entitled to, you uh, um, to avail themselves of the PPP program and who should bear the risk if it turns out that they're not. Um, uh, you know, so uh, th there, there's definitely been um, a growth in specific terms related to this. Another area where we've seen it, uh, uh, the pandemic result in some negotiations, um, has been around um, uh, rep and warrant insurance, which is the use of that has grown exponentially in the last decade in the United States. Um, when you and I had last talked in the fall, um, you know, part of what you and uh, what we had been discussing was um, uh, rep and warrant insurance and its growth. Uh, what we have seen, uh, you know, as as part of the latest wave tied to uh, the pandemic is at first insurers uh, were carving out from uh, their policies anything related to uh, the pandemic. Uh, and people were still looking to get policies written and they felt they needed to go along with that. As this is extended, those limitations have gotten much more narrow. And, uh, and we would expect that there would be more pushback, um, you know, now as, uh, in certain industries. And we've certainly seen that. So, uh, you know, overall, yeah, we, we've, we've definitely seen that our, our agreements, our, our typical architecture technology uh, has stayed the same. Uh, but there's definitely refinements, as you'd expect, is as careful lawyers, um, uh, you know, try and allocate the risks associated with the pandemic between a buyer and a seller uh, based on the particular circumstances of their, of, of their deal and what we're all undergoing here uh, in the middle of this pandemic. Luke, thanks for those illustrations. Um, sounds like a lot of uh, accelerated and uh, high volume of changes in a short period of time. Switching from deal terms to deal process, do you have any illustrations of how getting a deal done um, has been different and um, how getting to a good outcome for our clients has changed uh, in the current environment? The first thing I'd say is, you know, and this is true, just, uh, you know, on a, on a, in a micro sense, I mean, we've all seen it, we've all experienced it, um, you know, working remotely in such a sustained fashion um, is, is a challenge um, in many ways, uh, uh, but one of the key challenges is just establishing and maintaining connections, uh, um, you know, with others. And that could be with your teammates. Um, it can be, uh, you know, with your clients, it can be with opposing counsel. Um, and when you think about M&A, in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's a relationship driven business. And you certainly see this with our clients. I mean, so many of our clients, they look at a business opportunity and they analyze and they analyze it. But a lot of what it comes down to is, um, you know, if I acquire this company to make it work, I've got to integrate the people at that target company with mine. Will they fit within my culture? Or if you are the private equity sponsor looking to acquire a company, um, you know, how do I view this management team? you know, am I going to be able to work with these folks long term? Or do we see this business growing in the same way? And, and uh, can, I, can I really add value here? And a lot of that, uh, you know, 
uh, the answers to those questions are developed through contact with people, um, you know, face to face in meetings over a period of time while you're doing your due diligence. And that has changed dramatically over the last six months. I've had clients call up from overseas and say, you know, can you get on a plane and go to X, Y, or Z um, for a meeting? Uh, we can't travel there, but we were hoping you could just to be the face of our deal team. And it, it's really, um, it's raised some very, you know, difficult conversations to have with people, um, but then to also then try and find a way um, to build those connections to help people to, to get their deals done. So I, I know that that's a, you know, kind of a, a broad nebulous answer to the question, but I really think um, the, the issues that people see in so many aspects of their life uh, currently about trying to build connection is something that we're all struggling with um, and, uh, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in, in the M&A world. We're six months into it now. I think generally people have gotten very used to it. Uh, while we all have Zoom fatigue, I think we're all, all used to being on, on Zoom now. Uh, and uh, or one of the other uh, platforms that we use for video conferencing, um, you know, many of our technology clients were using this routinely, um, you know, even before the pandemic. So, uh, you know, it's the, the typical conservative lawyer class that has to catch up to that. Um, but, I, but I do believe people have done a great job of it. But it's that maintaining connection um, that to me is, is really one of the, the critical issues. I mean, when you think about it, a lot of what we've done from a deal perspective over the last 10 to 15 years has been done remotely. Uh, it's just been done over the phone or it's been done through virtual data rooms uh, and whatnot. Um, there's been less and less face-to-face -face negotiation than there used to be. Um, that becomes very difficult, I think, though, in, uh, in a sustained manner when you're not able to meet with your clients uh, in the same way, um, uh, when they can't call upon you or you can't call upon them, um, uh, you know, in, in a physical environment. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it, it has been a challenge, but I, but I think we're, we're all working to overcome that. So, Luke, 2020 elections. A lot of uh, talk and a lot of speculation has been going into how the elections would impact uh, private, public m and markets for months. Uh, some have been speculating for years. Um, what's, what have you been he hearing currently and, and what's the current take you're seeing, um, again, in the private, public m and markets vis-a-vis -vis how the elections may impact the remainder of the year? Ben, that's, that's a great question. And it's certainly one I think that firm leaders globally are, are focused on, as well as all of our clients, right? And um, if you look at what's happened so far this year, it's been a year of tremendous uncertainty uh, in terms of global economic outlook. It's been a time of tremendous unrest and upheaval uh, from a social perspective as well, uh, particularly here in the United States. I think in many other years, we would have seen a much more significant impact on day-to-day -day economics uh, uh, from a deal-making perspective. I mean, obviously, with the number of people that we have unemployed, there's no question there's just been a tremendous upheaval in, the, in this country as well as globally. Um, so I don't want to take away from that, but I guess what I'm pointing at is it's, it's really astounding that um, the capital markets and the M&A markets have kept up as well as they have so far this year. Um, and, uh, you know, at times you look at it and you say, how, you know, how is that going to continue? I think we are at the point uh, going into the election uh, where uh, we stand the risk that you, you don't see it continue in the same way. You know, definitely something I think everybody has their eye on. Um, it, it hasn't uh, generated a slowdown at this point. Luke, thank you. As always, it was a terrific conversation, and all of our listeners will benefit from hearing your words of wisdom. Thanks again. Sure, Ben. Thanks a lot for having me today. Thank you for listening to this episode in our Connected with Latham podcast series. You can subscribe and listen to new and archived episodes of Latham's podcast on LW.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. If you'd like more information about the topics in this podcast, please email us from links located in the show notes. We hope you'll join us again next time.
This podcast is provided as a service of Latham & Watkins, LLP. Listening to this podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and Latham and & Watkins, LLP, and you should not send confidential information to Latham & Watkins, LLP. While we make every effort to assure that the content of this podcast is accurate, comprehensive, and current, we do not warrant or guarantee any of those things. And you may not rely on this podcast as a substitute for legal research and or consulting a qualified attorney. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for engaging a lawyer to advise you on your individual needs. Should you require legal advice on the issues covered in this podcast, please consult a qualified attorney. Under New York's Code of Professional Responsibility, portions of this communication contain attorney advertising. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Results depend upon a variety of factors unique to each representation. Please direct all inquiries regarding the conduct of Latham & Watkins attorneys under the New York's disciplinary rules to Latham & Watkins, LLP, 885 3rd Avenue, New York, New York, 10022-4834, phone number 1212-906-1200.